How many clicks does it take to complete Geometry Dash? Well, I went on a quest to find out. And trust me, some of the strategies people use to achieve these are insane. So let's dive into this. We begin our journey with Stereo Madness, the first out of 21 levels. The first click is surprisingly brutal, and near frame perfect even. Fortunately though, the rest of the pre-drop wouldn't be too hard, allowing us to reach the drop where we would get one of the best moves for this challenge, the ship. The ship normally is very versatile, and this challenge is no different. You can either do this or this. Since this is the mode's first introduction, Rob was generous to make it very open, allowing us to pass this section in only 4 clicks, which is absurd. But our luck wouldn't last that long though, as the level's difficulty was only getting started. This red section was brutal, as it constantly plays around with your muscle memory. Click 18 especially would be brutal. For this, you have to land on a very specific point on this block, and pray that you get the second coin. If you don't, you head off to Spike Central. It doesn't help that the next click is also brutal, having little to no room for error. Once you complete this very fragile feeling ship part, you reach the finish line at 24 clicks. Let's see how difficult back on track will be. Back on track is commonly regarded as the easiest level, even more so than Stereo Madness. This even holds up for this challenge, as the level feels a lot more open. In fact, the ship part would be significantly easier than the one in Stereo Madness, only taking a few clicks. The level likely would have taken less clicks if not for the ending. You see, in this part, there are these odd looking walls that force you to immediately go down. While you can still jump on the ledge, it's difficult and saving a click like that is rare, causing it to eat up quite a few clicks, finishing off with 33. While it did take more, the level doesn't really have any choke points and sails a lot smoother than Stereo Madness. With 57 total clicks in our pool, let's see how long it will take to reach 100. Apparently not that long. The appeal of Polar Geist are the new jump rings, which allow you to jump midair. While they are a very exciting feature, they become less exciting when you realize you can't hold, which had been the main strategy thus far. Even with the level being more open than the previous, this downside with the jump rings prevented tons of click saves. Fortunately though, this ship part barely requires any clicks as you can tell, allowing us to reach the final cube with 29 clicks. Is it possible that we can beat Polargeist in under 33? Well, no. The ending brings back the jump rings in larger quantities this time, and even brings back those walls from back on track that prevented you holding. Even with all these optimizations, Polar Geist would end up taking over 62 clicks, double that of back on track. Our total pool of clicks is now 119. Imagine what it'll be like when we reach the demon levels. As helpless as the jump ring situation was, Dry Out was the light at the end of the tunnel. The level only has 2 jump rings, compared to the near 30 in Polar Geist. Despite the beginning being a lot tighter this time around, I was able to use this coin route to save a few clicks, leading me to the drop. The appeal of this level is that the player can now be upside down, and fortunately, Rob leaned into holding for this section, allowing me to pass this huge portion of the level in only 8 clicks. Clicks like 22 and 20 especially help lower the amount of clicks needed to just 42, significantly less than Polargeist. Will this be a new direction of levels requiring significantly less clicks, or was this just an outlier in a sea of jump rings? There's something I forgot to mention. You see, when you die in Geometry Dash, most things get reset, including your clicks in that attempt. So if you die and don't let go, then you can get an input for free. While this isn't useful in every level, it certainly isn't base after base, which has a brutal pre-drop. On click 6 for example, you have to awkwardly hit this jump ring after jumping at the last second. This gives you significantly more momentum with this jump pad, allowing you to skip a few jumps, including this triple. And as you can see, the cube barely makes it here. These very awkward jump ring shenanigans would continue until the drop. Now fortunately, it's very similar to Dry Out's drop, where you hold for most of the inputs, unless you're a psychopath who clicks on every jump. I was even able to cop this coin that saved a couple clicks. Normally, these coins in base after base are very boring, as often the main path is harder, but in this challenge it's a lifesaver. What wouldn't be a lifesaver however would be these stupid wall structures from back on track, who would rudely make an unexpected appearance shaving off a couple clicks I could have potentially skipped. 
These are the new hero, Brian. After this excruciating ending, I was able to finish with 41 total clicks. While this was less than Dryout or Polargeist, this was likely the hardest one yet, with us breaking the 200 click barrier. I wonder how many you'll be at when I approach Finger Dash. Unfortunately, the jump rings would finally make a comeback, as Rob finally decided to spice up Level's gameplay. How dare him. Anyway, this pre-drop was brutal. But at least I was able to use this copy pasted dry out coin route to save a couple of clicks, leading us to the drop. Now, unlike the previous levels, this drop was horrible. Throughout it are plastered long, unavoidable jumping segments that eat up tons of clicks. By the time we reach the shit part, we're already at 40, which is where base after base would have ended. It didn't help that the second drop would be even less open, and despite me taking an automatic coin route, I would still finish this level in a troublesome 71 clicks. I guess can't let go, can't let go of holding. I'm sorry. Remember how in base after base, we had to die in order to save an input? Well, that strategy would finally make a comeback in Jumper. Now, despite being called Jumper, there weren't many places you could jump besides the main path, like can't let go. I would be able to save some clicks in the ship section, as by landing on the ledges of these blocks, I would be able to rest even if it was for a split second. While this did make the part infinitely more difficult, I was able to snatch the secret coin, so I'm not complaining. With these saved clicks from the ship, I would finish the final part in only 68 clicks, significantly less than can let goes. Time Machine would be the calm before the storm. While this was the first ever level included after the game's release, the appeal of the level, the mirror portal, fortunately wouldn't change much, sparing me my sanity, for now at least. Time Machine ended up being very similar to Can't Let Go, as the level feels very claustrophobic at times. It also ended up barring this jumping chain, which while making the gameplay more interesting, would also hinder the amount of potential click saves. I was also beginning to notice how difficult ship parts were getting. Previously, it might have been the occasional structure here and there with some spikes on the ceiling, but now it had become this. Due to the ship's nature, it doesn't need up clicks, but makes you want to go into a time machine and never play this level again. After completing this extremely awkward ship ending, we would get a total of 71 clicks, trying to let go in inputs and also driving people insane. With our total click counter breaking the 300 click barrier, I knew things were only just getting started. The gravity ball would be introduced in cycles, which has to be one of the worst features for this challenge. You can't hold with the ball, so no matter how hard you'll try to save a few clicks, you'll only be able to skip one or two. This will make the level the easiest to perform, but also the least optimized. And while I would save a few clicks here and there, it wouldn't prevent my painful total of 79, the most out of any so far. Let's hope X-Step isn't as bad. Except would introduce the blue jump ring, which had me worried. Usually when an update has a feature, Rob showcases it throughout the whole level. But surprisingly, there are only 5 of them in this insignificant ballpark at the end of the level. The only reason I could really give as to why he did this was because he added them later into development. As for example, there are parts in Finger Dash that use the old color triggers, right next to the outdated color triggers. This isn't any ground to complain on however as it saves tons of clicks. Anyway, the level would start off similar to Cycles, until you approach this ship part, which is brutal. But, if you thought this ship part was awkward, you haven't seen anything yet. The drop would feature these blue pad structures that normally players avoid. While they don't instantly kill you, they can easily mess up your line of sight. Fortunately, I would use them to my advantage, as by awkwardly targeting a few of them, you're able to save hundreds of clicks. I was even able to collect every single coin in this level, which is something I hadn't been able to do since base after base. But still, after collecting these coins, abusing these pads, and skipping these jump rings, I would still beat this in over 85 clicks, the highest so far. Let's see if things continue to worsen. When I opened Cutter Funk, I immediately noticed that Rob can't let go of this dumb jump ring chain that I thought had disappeared since Time Machine. Anyway, the level would introduce size portals, which weren't much to worry about besides the drop. The climax of the level would be a ballpark, which is clearly troubling for many reasons. And unlike levels like Cycles, there weren't any skips, so a player who isn't even doing this challenge would complete the part in the same amount of clicks as this. How absurd. The ship wouldn't get any better, 
as it was structured in a way that didn't let you hold up and down, forcing you to awkwardly resort to hitting these staircases. But if you thought this mess of a level was over, you were far from correct. Rob was really liking this claustrophobic feel that had appeared in many levels prior, like Time Machine and Cycles, disabling me from shaving off lots of clicks. I was even forced to take this infamous third coin that was more inconsistent than 2.2's release date. This was easily the worst level for this challenge yet, as there was no room for error. Finishing with 103 clicks, the jump ring chains, the ball parts, the infamously tight quarters all led up to this quantity. Was this how all future levels would be? Remember how in base after base, we had to die in order to save an input? Well, this would make a comeback once again in theory of everything. After everything I had gone through, this level seemed to be a resting point. Sure, there were jump rings everywhere, but it couldn't get any worse, right? The UFO eats up tons of inputs despite being an airborne vehicle. It wasn't as bad as the gravity ball, as it was still somewhat in control of how many inputs it would take to clear some sections, but barely. The UFO was everywhere in this level. But what if I told you that despite there being a huge portion of the level left, I would still save more inputs than Click 18 from Stereo Madness. You see, after collecting this route copycat of a coin, we would approach this set of slabs. Normally, you're supposed to boost yourself with this jump pad, but instead you can opt to do barely scares in between these saws and falling to the ground. You'd think that there'd at least be spikes at the bottom to prevent you from skipping the level, but no, it's empty. Allowing us to pass in only 83 clicks, it's possible that the level would have tied Clutterfunk if not for the secret way, but I guess I'll never know. Electroman Adventures is commonly regarded as a calm before the storm. Unfortunately, Rob decided to put these spike pillars everywhere, preventing me from holding anywhere. This level felt really similar to Cycles, as there were many places you could save clicks. The biggest skip I was able to do was with this third coin, where the route is easier than the main path. I really don't understand why these kinds of coins exist, but I'm not complaining. The level would take 96 clicks, but it would be nothing compared to our first demon level, Club Step. Club Step would be another level to utilize the dying mechanic to save an input, something that was definitely needed for the cesspool. When you enter the map, hundreds of jump rings are shoved in your face that are completely unavoidable. Even this corn route couldn't save me from my demise. The only section of the level that had any breathing room would be this memory section that unfortunately lasted at most a few seconds. The rest of the level would be relentless, having no room for error whatsoever, especially with sections like this UFO. There isn't even a part I can pinpoint for being harder than everything else, due to them all being brutal. If you don't believe me, just look at this section. I don't even have to say anything. I searched everywhere for possible skips, but found barely any. And by the time the player would touch the finish line, they had already spent 115 clicks. The total pool of clicks was now nearing 1000, with every level one-upping each other. It's insane how we went from 30 and back on track to over 100 in club step. While we wouldn't get a demon for a few more levels, by the time we did, things would get insane. Electrodynamics would be another level to use the die mechanic, followed by one of the most awkward pre-drops imaginable. It's by only lasting a couple seconds. After the drop hits, we're introduced to 2 times speed, which greatly affects the challenge, making previously impossible saves possible. This doesn't make this any easier, however, as setups like you going above the saw on the ship to save an input causes the level to be very inconsistent. I seriously think that no one on earth has ever done this swag route. After grinding away clicks in this UFO part, we approach the second drop, being the worst one thus far. Even without this challenge, this section is brutal, but with it, it's near impossible. You can't tell me that barely avoiding these spikes on the ground and ceiling can ever get consistent. And upon finishing this excruciating shit part, we reached the finish line with 91 clicks, significantly less than levels like Clutterfung and Club Step. Is it possible that we could use these speed portals to our advantage? While Hexagon Force would introduce duos, the more important feature are slopes, which save tons of inputs. Instead of barely gliding on these blocky cliffs, we can instead opt to rest on them. That applies to the ship section at the start, which is one of the best official level parts. Seriously, it's just so enjoyable to fly through. Unfortunately though, that would all be ruined with this cube part. Normally, this section is very fun to play, as you can buffer nearly every click with these jump rings. That's awful for this challenge though. 
So instead, we have to use these very convenient spike hitboxes to touch the tip of the slope. This saves a few clicks, and even allows us to skip the slow speed portal in this UFO section, which feels so cursed. Out of this whole challenge, this part was the hardest to do consistently, even harder than any section in Club Zep or Electrodynamics. However, it doesn't end there. In this dual ship, you can barely squeeze through this gap to skip a size portal, allowing us to glide on these slopes way more than we could have normally. Since we're many, we're also able to land this otherwise impossible seeker way, shaving off hundreds of potential clicks. Seriously, with how the ending of Hexagon Force is, it's possible that we could have gone into hundreds if not for the seeker way, allowing us to finish with 76 clicks. Could this be a redemption arc? Blast Processing would finally introduce the wave, one of the best game modes for this challenge. The previous ate up a lot of clicks, either from set paths you need to follow, or not being able to go higher very well. The wave is similar to the ship, where you can go from the bottom and top of the screen in only a single input. Unfortunately though, there are many wave parts, as Rob wanted to actually make the gameplay interesting. Quite unfortunate. Fortunately, the second and third coin would really come in clutch, and after a very awkward ending, it's possible to beat this in only 94 clicks. While this is significantly more than the previous two, Rob dabbled into every mode for this level, especially the UFO and Ball, preventing a lot of potential click saves. Let's see how our second demon level will be with all this new content. Another level that would use the dying strategy would be Theory of Everything 2, our second demon level. We would instantly be met with tons of jump rings splattered everywhere, with clicks 10 through 13 being the worst offenders. There's no way on earth that this would ever get consistent. Luckily though, in this drop part, we're able to easily skip this speed portal by holding as the ship, causing this UFO part to continue being 2 times speed. It also seemed that Ralph forgot to playtest the ball, because there are more skips in this than the impossible game. Most of the level would be carried by Wade, which is an absolute lifesaver. Another lifesaver would be this iconic third coin that I was able to collect. What's with coin routes being easier than the main path? I don't get it. We reached the finish line with over 120 clicks, way more than club set. This level definitely required more knowledge of the game and the frequent game mode changes certainly did not help. And unlike Clepsep, we would soon have another demon level enter the ring, this time being the hardest. Getting under 2,000 clicks in our pool would be a miracle by this point. Geometrical Dominator would begin with a dying strategy, a good start. After that, we would be introduced to the robot, which is a lackluster mode. While you can occasionally skip a jump ring here and there, it's worse than the cube since you can't hold in a way that's useful. While I was able to use a coin route here and there to save some clicks, it didn't stop me from going over 100 clicks. Levels were beginning to use the cube a lot less frequently, and stuff like moving objects certainly didn't help the situation. Deadlocked would be our third and final demon level, being the hardest one yet. After the iconic death strategy, jump rings are shoved in our face, with most of them being unavoidable except this green jump ring chain. And after sacrificing nearly the entirety of Studio Mattis' inputs to the pre-drop, we approached the wave. And if you thought the wave was already bad enough, then you probably wouldn't want to try this. The amount of precision needed for this is insane. We would then grab this key for the first coin, which while being significantly more difficult, would save a click or two despite the player not even collecting the coin afterwards. After dodging these chompies and collecting a coin, we would approach the worst part of the level. Now, when I say the wave was extremely good for this challenge, I wasn't lying. But I couldn't say the same for your sanity. Despite only lasting a second or two, it's enough to kill any consistency you'd have with the level. The player still ends up finishing this part in over 150 clicks, significantly more than 3 of everything 2 or club step. While you could get this record down to 120, I doubt it's humanly possible. With the hardest level out of the way, one level remains. Finger Dash would finally introduce a helpful jump ring, the Dash Ring. This ring allows you to skip sizable portions of the level, like this section where you can skip this jump. This would be completely normal. However, Rob decided to put an S block in a teleport portal, meaning Rob knew of the existence of this skip, which is really strange. To counteract that, however, J blocks were also added, which wouldn't let you hold after hitting a blue jump ring. Also, Rob decided to spam these lasers everywhere, which significantly hinders any saves. We would also be introduced to the spider, which is effectively a ball, but a lot more limiting. 
When was the last time you performed an alternative path in a level with a spider? Aside from the similarities with the ball and cycles, the level also feels as claustrophobic as it as well. Why are these lasers everywhere, but going through destruction is easily doable? It doesn't make any sense. There isn't much to say as this level is still not taking 116 clicks, a lot more than levels like Cycles or Time Machine, bringing our total pool of clicks to 1,700. While this was significantly better than 2,000, I still feel like a lot of saves should have been achievable, but just weren't. I doubt this challenge will ever be completed, but a challenge I was able to complete was surviving 100 recent levels. Go check it out, and as always, thanks for watching.